Hello. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. My name is uh, Adam Hirschfelder. I'm with the programming team here at the Commonwealth Club. It's great to have you all here in person. We also have a crowd online. We are doing our programs, what we call hybrid now, in person here, uh, as well as people watching online. But it is great to have folks here. The Commonwealth Club is coming back uh, as it once was with programs nearly every day of the week in person. So uh, we thank all of you uh, who've come here. Real quick, I'd like to ask uh, how many people here are members? Oh good, a lot of members, that's great. But I see some hands that are not. You know what that means. You can become one, and there's a folks here tonight who can uh, help you become a member of the Commonwealth Club. There's no better time because uh, of all the great programs we're going to be doing in person back in this beautiful building. Um, real quick, we ask, please, turn off your phones, buzzers, sounds, iPads, whatever you have, because not only will you bother the people here, you will, people online can also be bothered by it, so please uh, do that. Uh, real quick, how many people were with us last June when we reopened our building after 15 months? Okay, some people were. That's great. This builds on that great event as we reopened for the first time in 15 months. Folks, remember we had an author here named Adrian Miller who talked about the history of barbecue and the role of African Americans in the barbecue tradition in the United States. It was a fantastic event and we reopened our building. If you remember that day uh, up on our roof deck, we had a brief interview with Oakland's Matt Horn, whose barbecue restaurant was making, uh, making waves. Well, the waves have only gotten bigger uh, over the past um, year, and it is great to have Matt Horn in, uh, back here at the club to talk about everything that has happened since and to celebrate his new cookbook, which is for sale in the back. Real quick, after the program, we will have Horn Barbecue out uh, in the hallway in the other side of the room. Uh, Matt will be signing his cookbook here on stage after the program. And yes, of course, we will have the Warriors game on TV so people don't have to run. We know the program is at 7. We'll get started, so we'll be done right around 7.05, right for tip-off. We understand those things. So with that, uh, I am going to welcome to the stage Cecilia Phillips from KQED's Check Please Bay Area and Oakland's Matt Horn. You ready? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's do this. This is amazing. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here with you. Um, I should introduce myself. I'm actually the uh, coordinating producer and on-camera reporter for KQED's Check Please Bay Area. Um, so I've actually... <laughs> oh. They're clapping for Chuck, please, not for me. No one knows me yet, but hopefully they will soon. Um, I have a segment within the show called Cecilia Tries It, where I actually go around to off the beaten path locations in the Bay Area and discover new, unique foods that people can enjoy at various places that are not brick and mortar restaurants. So I know a little bit about the food scene here in the Bay Area, um, in addition to working under several celebrity chefs and um, being a food tour guide in San Francisco for multiple years. So. Um, I'm thrilled to be here with you. Nice uh, honor. Thank you. I'm, I'm really glad that the Commonwealth Club asked me as well, so I'm just super excited. Um, and we're also here, obviously, to celebrate you and your latest of many greatest accomplishments, which is your new cookbook that's yeah. out, yeah. Um, Horn Barbecue Recipes and Traditions from a Master of the Art of Barbecue. Um, so this book is going to be coming out soon and uh, is out, and we are going to be talking about that tonight, um, amongst uh, so many other things. Um, I'm very pleased that today's uh, program is also in person. So thank you all for being here. The last you, time yeah. that you were here was the first in-person yeah, right. event yeah, that they had. So a lot's changed since then. We'll talk about that as well. I also want to say hello to everyone virtually. Hello. Thank you all so much for being here as well. Um, you all are going to have fun. They're going to have fun. They're not going to have as much fun as you are because you all are going to get barbecue at the end of this. But um, <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. going to be great. Yeah. It's going to be great. 
Hopefully that will encourage them to come out again yeah, next yeah. time. Um, let's see here. So if you all want to continue to learn about more events at the Commonwealth Club, you'll need to visit www.commonwealthclub.org and um, be able to see more events just like this from this evening. Um, a quick note before we jump in, we will have a chance for each of you to write out questions if you have them um, on comment cards, and they'll bring those forward. And all of you virtually, you'll have a chance to also drop any questions you have in the chat, and we'll try to answer them this evening. Yeah. with Matt. Um, so I just want to get into it. Can we just get started? And I want to give them a little bit of background about how you and I actually know each other. Yeah, we did. Uh, we worked on a project. Um, I think that was in the beginning of the pandemic. Was it yeah, a couple of years back? You came and did this wonderful project. It was like your first project, right? So it was really amazing because um, you and I met on your opening day it was. of your restaurant, Horn Barbecue. And oh. um, you were gracious enough to have me there as a newer reporter. So I was doing my first piece. You're opening your first restaurant. Right, yeah, <laughs> yeah right. You know, it was wonderful, too. I mean, that day was just so many, so many different emotions. And we had a lot going on. We were just trying to get everybody ready to go, get our staff, you know, get them aligned what was going on. Then we had all the people that were outside. So it was a very uh, emotional day. It was very emotional. You yeah, had um, emotional. you had gone through so much prior yeah. to that moment. And so it was an honor to be there. Uh, Nina, your, your wife, is here. Uh, you both were there the moments that the doors opened and um, you greeted everybody. Right. What was that journey like uh, getting to that moment in time? Uh, you know what? When we open, when we open up those doors and, you know, Many times before doing the pop-ups, we've had guests come, and, you know, we were always grateful for that. But that moment was special because, you know, we did have to go through quite a bit of adversity just to get the restaurant open. The restaurant business, as we know, it, it's a challenge to even operate a restaurant. And, you know, the pandemic has shown us that, you know, restaurants were hit really hard, you know what I mean? So it's like it's, it's not an easy thing to, to operate or keep a restaurant rolling. But I don't know, it's just like that day when those doors open, kind of look back at everything we had to go through prior to opening the restaurant, just the pop-ups, the farmer's markets, the the failed events, I mean, the journey, you know, just to get to that point. So it was, um, we were very gracious, very gracious, and we still are, but that day was something special. It was, and um, I just remember the moment that you both opened the door and just this kind of like wave of almost like, relief at, at, to some degree that you had finally made it. Um, let's talk about some of the other things that you had gone through. Um, there was permitting issues. There was all these sorts of things that got you to that moment. What, what kept you going? Why, why didn't you just decide to potentially quit or not open like a lot of restaurants waited? Um, you decided to keep forging on. Well, you know what? I think it's, I think it's um, pretty much a testament to you know who I am, my character, my upbringing. My parents always taught us that you know, when you start anything in life, you have to finish it and finish what you start. But, you know, I talk about in the book that, you know, I wanted to quit barbecue at one point. It's not that, you know, it, it became too too much for me, but it's, I just felt that uh, I wasn't making progress with what I was doing. And I felt that, you know, that one particular day that made me decide I wanted to walk away from barbecue, at that point, um, everything just kind of had built up to that, to that moment. And... Um, I didn't quit barbecue. I continued to, you know, push along, be resilient, and, you know, just kind of walk by faith. So then once we, once we ended up getting the keys to the building for the restaurant, in my mind, it was going to be a simple, like, okay, we're going to go in, work the interior, you know, paint, do this sort of thing. And, you know, there was a, a whole other set of challenges that faced us, you know. So I think that you know, with anything that you want to accomplish in life, you, there's, there has to be a measure of perseverance. You have to be willing to overcome challenges that come and setbacks and adversity. But I've always openly embraced adversity, you know? So I, I feel like that's what builds character, you know? That's what builds, um, you know, that's what kind of gives you like that armor to be able to kind of take on things uh, with, with uh, poise and, and carry on and stride. So that's, that's what we did. I mean, I knew that once we opened up Horn Barbecue and in the community where we are, that not only would it be you know something really great for the community but we were looking forward to being being really great uh neighbors in our community so we knew that it was bigger than you know to myself it was something that would touch the community yeah 
So let's talk about a couple of different things there. Let's unpack it. So, I mean, you just kind of mentioned uh, the community that you serve right. currently for Horn Barbecue. Let's talk about the space. Let's talk about West Oakland. I think that one of the important parts of your story is that um, the type of barbecue that you do has been brought to, you know, the West Coast, as people are kind of calling it. And it specifically is landing in a very important, culturally interesting neighborhood mm -hmm. for where the building's located. Can you speak to that and why that's important to you? Yeah, no, absolutely. I feel that, um, you know, I have to carry on a torch of those that have come before me, right? So with West Oakland, we started there before we even started looking into actually having a restaurant, we were doing pop-ups all over, but Oakland was the very first place we started to do those pop-ups. West Oakland specifically, we got a lot of support there, and not too far from where the building is, you know, that's where we would host all of our events. But, you know, there was a chef, Chef Tanya Holland was there before. She had Brown Sugar Kitchen in that space, and she did a lot of great things there. So, you know, once she decided to move out of there, it became available to us. You know, after wrapping up doing the pop-ups every weekend, I would always drive by that space. And, you know, I never thought like, hey, you know, I want this to be my home. It was just a situation where it became available and, you know, we wanted to seize that opportunity because, you know, we wanted to be a part of that neighborhood. There's not a lot of, there was no food there other than her restaurant. And, um, you know, we wanted to bring something great there and, you know, do something really cool. A show of hands, how many people have made it out to Horn Barbecue? Okay, a couple of people. Yeah, you need cool. to get over to Oakland. <laughs> we got to get them out there. Yeah, right. Um, you said that it was kind of one of the last spots on the destination of the Great Black Migration. Right. Can we talk more about that? Yeah, I think that, you know, uh, when the Great Migration happened and a lot of, you know, blacks moved from the south, um, West Oakland's place where, you know, that was the last stop of it. So when you think of Oakland, West Oakland, just the city in general, there's a lot of rich history there, especially with the ports and, you know, just other types of businesses. But it's just one of those things where with us being a black-owned business and what we're trying to do with pushing the culture of barbecue, being in West Oakland made sense. I mean, we could have went anywhere to operate our business, but I kind of felt like that was the place that really opened itself up for us to be able to, you know, offer what we do. So that was very, that was always something that's conscious with us. And even as we move forward, we're always thinking about that. Just like how can we push forward, culture forward, but also to honor those that have come before us. How has the neighborhood received you since then? Because I remember that one of the things that was part of the challenges of you opening Horn Barbecue was permitting. So you had done all this planning, you had secured the space, you were ready to go, and then there was a big push about having a smoker in that neighborhood. Not to mention that you also have the largest smoker indoors yeah. in, in California. California. I mean, yeah, yeah, we had to. <laughs> so, so that, so here it is, you know, this was one Horn Barbecue being the first restaurant. Um, I had no experience going into it. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, this is going to be a turnkey situation. I would just bring Lucille in, park Lucille in the back. Who's Lucille? So the, the smoker, right? So Lucille is my uh, <laughs> Lucille is my my beloved smoker, uh, my my 500 gallon smoker. I named her Lucille because um, many nights, like out on farms and just being out there by myself, all I had was the fire, the wood, the cook, the cooker, and I would always listen to BB King, Lucille. So I'd have that plan, and I don't know, it always complemented itself where it was with the fire, so that's why I ended up naming her Lucille. <laughs> but I just wanted to just put the smoker in the back, open up the restaurant, do it that way, and it didn't work out like that. We had to go through um, quite a bit of obstacles in terms of just trying to educate the city and county on smoking regulations and, you know, just... It's a smoker. Don't call it a smoker. Well, it's a wood-burning oven. <laughs> well, you can have a wood-burning oven, but, you know, it's, it's the same. You know, that's what we call it. Or barbecue pit or whatnot. So we had to go through that. And one of the things that we, that helped us to overcome it was, you know, to put the smoker indoor and put it under a hood. So, you know, the building wasn't designed for horn barbecue. We took what we had. We had to try to make the best out of our situation. So... You know, we ended up tearing out a wall. We put the hood in. We put a thousand-gallon smoker inside, and um, we we also had to get the smoker um, NSF and UL certified, which all kitchen equipment in any restaurant 
you know, has to, you know, be NSF certified. So we had to fly uh, um, an inspector and a, a specialist out from Texas just to uh, certify the smoker that we had built. So we had been talking to this guy for weeks. So finally, we, we pay for him to come out. He looked at the smoker for maybe about five or ten minutes, and he was like, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> he, was like, he was just like, hey, you know what? I could have did this you know, over, over Zoom or Skype or something. <laughs> and I'm like, well, you know, that's great. And you know what? He, flew, he literally flew out there just to give us a little sticker. He gave us that sticker. That sticker was, you know, the, the thing that would allow us to move forward with, you know, with, with the county. But you pivoted. You worked with it, and you. you well, you know what? That's the thing. It's like, you know, prior to getting into cooking and doing barbecue, um, I've experienced quite a bit of adversity in my life, just like with anybody else, right? We all go through challenges. So I, I, I was already committed. I'm like, you know what? I'm already in. Um, we're gonna keep going. I, I say, you know, all the time, you know, you have to. If you want to take the island, you got to burn the boats. And I was just like, I'm all in. We're going to push this forward because I know that the purpose of what we're trying to pursue is greater than the adversity that you know we're presently facing. So we did that. We put the smoker inside. Um, then you know it was told to me that hey, you know what? After a year of dealing with this, that you know you can have smokers outside. <laughs> I'm just like, I'm like, wow. I'm like, well, <laughs> Okay, so you know, I took advantage of that, and you know, we have, you know, we have about eight smokers now mm -hmm. that are outside. That's what we need to be able to produce the amount of food we're cooking every week. And we should make note to everybody: you're not like near a strip mall. You're not like near. No. You are in the middle of kind of nowhere. What? So correct, <laughs> right? Yeah, it is. It is. It's um, it's in a very, uh, very unique location, and um, next to a recycling plant. And other than that, I mean, it's just. It's a very industrial area, so that worked itself out. We don't have to worry about any complaints. Well, and, you know, nobody from the community is complaining, but we're, we're grateful to be where we are. And we, you know, we made it happen, and that's where a lot of those emotions came from. You know, you were there documenting it, and um, it was just kind of like everything we had been through up to that point. But then to be at the block and to be serving the, uh, the different guests that were there waiting for, I mean, people were waiting for, for hours. And I always say that if people are going to come and our guests are going to come and stand in line and wait for hours, like we, they deserve excellence. We owe it to them day in and day out. But to be on the side of the block where I'm serving the meats and, you know, you're wanting to take orders and not, and you're seeing guests crying as well, that meant a lot. It's, it says a lot about that community as well. Yeah. That they I, were that supportive of us. Exactly. I remember that day. And so I think some of the first people might have gotten there at six in the morning, seven yeah, in the morning. Yeah. And then you opened doors, I think, at a, maybe the 11. 11. Yeah. And then the line stretched down three three city blocks. Yeah, it did. I got, I got all that. Yeah, it did. <laughs> I walked the whole line. <laughs> and um, yeah, you were sold out, I think, by maybe one o'clock, two o'clock. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was, it was quite a feat. Yeah, it was, yeah, it was. And you know what? Just to be able to to feed everybody. That's what keeps, you know, that's what keeps us going and keeps the fires lit. So since then, you have now um, been reviewed in the New York Times. You are a James Beard finalist. Mm -hmm. We can get... Thank you. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, a food and wine top new chef in America as well. And you've gotten attention, of course, from the Michelin Guide, Sunset Magazine, and a podcast with David Chang. So I know you a little bit, and I know how <laughs> right. driven you are. Right. Was that all part of the plan? You know what? Um, I, so earlier on, I, I, told, um, I told my wife, I said, um, and this is just at the farmer's market. I mean, nobody's showing up at this point. I'm like giving food away. I'm like, we're not making any money. And I told her, she was just like, you know, what do you want to accomplish with this? And I'm like, well, I want to put out the best product I can put out. Which is like, but is there anything that you'd like to achieve within barbecue? And I said, you know what? If I was to get recognized by Food and Wine Best New Chef or maybe James Beard Foundation, that would be that would I would be, that would be just phenomenal. And I'll you know, it may never happen, but I'll try to push towards that because I always try to challenge myself to go after something that you know if it. If, if your dreams don't make you feel uncomfortable, then they're not big enough, right? So with that being said, I told her, I said, hey, those two things would be great. I said, but could you imagine if Michelin 
acknowledge barbecue, like, you know, because, you know, I'm coming from a backyard. I'm coming from my grandmother's backyard, self-taught, and those were the things I said earlier on. So now, you know, we're, we're, we're here, um, you know, to accomplish those things. I think that I just uh, stay focused on what it is that I was wanting to do. And, you know, at times where I wanted to quit or pivot, I stay. When the light at the end of the tunnel goes out, what do you do? You have to keep moving forward and walk by faith, right? So I had to just keep putting one foot, you know, and that's what we did. We didn't cut any corners. And I was very relentless about what we were wanting to, to accomplish. So I'm grateful to be able to accomplish that. It's humbling. It is. And yep. you are a very humble person as well. So I'll be here to, you know, just continue to boost you up about all Thank the amazing you. things you've done. Thank you. um, oh, it looks like we've got some maybe some comment cards going around. So make sure that if you have questions, please write them down because we can get them answered from from Matt. So let's take it back a little bit. Mm -hmm. Let's let's start at the beginning of the dream. Um, you uh, were working in a shoe store. Correct. <laughs> and yeah. um, at some point you decided this isn't for me, you left, and let's take the audience along the journey of, of what it was that got you to this point today. So, so literally, I mean, this is gonna, so coming out of high school, I went directly into a military academy on the East Coast. It was Valley Forge Military Academy. I played football there, I ran track. After doing the military academy and being on the East Coast, I decided that I wanted to come back home so I came back home, I went to school, I was out in Los Angeles and um, was going to school, still playing football, but then I ended up, you know, having an injury in my wrist, had to get surgery, that was discouraging, that was a, another setback. And, you know, as I went through, um, you know, my physical therapy and whatnot, I had to, you know, you have to work, I have to, I have to work. So, you know, I, I ended up working as a manager at a shoe store. And I would walk in there every day before I would go in and clock in. I would just tell myself that, hey, you know what? This isn't the final, this isn't the final destination. What this is is just a temporary spot, a temporary destination where we're going. And I always thought about that. And like I said, the people that work there, I was grateful to be able to work alongside with them. But I knew that my life had a greater purpose because uh, I aspired for more. My thoughts and dreams and aspirations were bigger than just, you know, you know, hey, how you doing today? Would you like me to help you try on some shoes and that sort of thing? <laughs> Which it's okay to do that as well. Yeah, you had a different I wanted thing. more. I wanted more. I, that's the only work that I'd ever done, you know. And I wanted to do more. And I just kind of made the decision that, you know, that I'm going to walk away from this and I'm going to try and go and pursue something di completely different. And like I said, the one thing that really gave me peace during that time of my life was going in the kitchen and cooking. And it wasn't anything special. It was, you know, like spaghetti and pasta and burgers and stuff like that. You know, just something just simple to make at home for yourself. But I found peace in that, you know. I think we have to try to find joy in the little things in life, you know. We're always looking for the next thing and where are we going next and what to build next. But, you know, I'm always, um, I try to take a, take a look at where I am now and try to enjoy those things. And that's how it all got going. I heard that um, one of the moments where you were determining, you know, what you were going to cook actually involved meeting your now wife. Mm -hmm. You um, have a kind of humorous story about attempting one of your first cooks in order to impress her. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, I'm like, okay, I want to invite her over to have a nice lunch, you know, something, just to try to do something nice, right? And... Um, I went and got a bunch of meat, like just a bunch of uh, ribs, and I was cooking on a little Weber grill. And I didn't even let the coals get white, you know, the coals were black, it was just, it was torching. I could smell the meat like burning, I kept flipping it back and forth. I had an apron on, I don't like know where I got the apron from. <laughs> but you know, I'm cooking this food for it and whatnot, and then once the ribs where I felt were done, um, they were cooked, but they were still like, you know, it could have went a little bit farther, right? <laughs> so I, I grabbed just like a bottle of barbecue sauce because in my mind I thought with barbecue, that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> so I just cover the ribs with it, cut it up, make a plate, and I'm trying to eat these tough ribs and I'm just like, I'm starving, right? <laughs> and I'm just trying to pull them apart and I look, I glance over and, you know, there was like a little bite out of the ribs. <laughs> and I just was like, I just had to ask. And I'm like, 
I don't know why I care. I just, I care. I'm like, hey, you know, like, is everything good? And she was just like, you want me to be honest with you? And I'm like, yeah, just <laughs> be honest with me, you know? And she was just like, you know, well, um, the ribs are a little tough. <laughs> and, and I'm like, oh, I'm like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Um, do you want me to grab you something else? She's like, no, 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 I'm fine. She's like, but thank you. She's like, you know, my dad does a lot of barbecuing, and our family, we, we cook a lot. And um, they, yeah, they're just, you know, they're, they're a little under. I'm like, okay. So, you know, my plate is completely, like, chewed up to the bone, right? <laughs> so I take her plate, and I take it in the kitchen, and literally the rest of the time that, you know, we spent the rest of the day together, um, I don't recall anything else other than the comment made about those ribs. <laughs> and I, you know, and we went about we went about the day, and that's all I can keep thinking about. But from that point, I mean, literally, um, I went to sleep that night, and I laid in bed. I was just like, what could I have done differently? And it wasn't at that point where I'm just like, okay, hey, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. It was just like, it's just, I look back at that time, and I'm like, why did you care so much? It's literally the attention to detail and those those really fine, um, the fine details where I'm like, what could I have done differently? Well, I know now what I could have done differently. <laughs> I was, you know, I'm trying to rush the ribs and, and that sort of thing because we were hungry, I mean, I'm hungry. <laughs> and that's the thing where I learned patience with barbecue. So, you know, come time for me to, when I did decide I wanted to start, uh, you know, I wanted to pursue a, a life and journey of barbecue, in my grandmother's backyard, I learned a lot about patience. You know, I'm just there by myself. And I was really um, intent on teaching myself all the ins and outs of all the fine details of barbecue. And that was one of the things. That grill that was in her backyard, opened it up, lit the fire, did the same exact thing. And I'll never forget her saying, um, hey, you know, my grandmother's like, you know, I, I think I saw your grandfather burning something in that little box right there. And I'm like, really? And I didn't even think to use it. So I cleaned the box out, you know, and I put the wood source there and put nothing inside of the main smoking chamber. And when I lit the fire there, totally different product. And so that's where I, you know, when I noticed that there was a change there, I, that's where the R&D, uh, the journey of the, the really detailed R&D began. That's where it happened. That's where it started. That's amazing. Um, so let's see. So you've done the pop-ups, you've, you've gotten um, the restaurant together, uh, you have continued on your vision. Mm -hmm. You now are opening and have opened Cowbird, mm -hmm. which is um, also about amazing, great tasting food and chicken. But um, it seems like you definitely have a very specific vision with the types of food that you uh, want to prepare and share with the world. Um, what have these sorts of foods meant to you, and, and what is barbecue for you? Um, especially talking about what we talked about before, the great black migration, being a black chef who's making this sort of food. What does that mean to you? Why, why choose this type of cuisine? Uh, you know what? I try to, when I, when I look at the, the type of food that... Um the type of food that I prepare or any concept that we open up you know, under, under the group, I try to stick with food that connects me to, uh, to my past, but also to my, you know, to my family and my culture. Um, barbecue is at every wedding, every f funeral, every whatever. Like everybody just wanted to have barbecue. And as kids, you know, we enjoyed eating it, but it wasn't something that, you know, we wanted to eat all the time. But we always found ourselves eating, eating a lot of barbecue. And that was a way that my family knew to bring each other, bring each other together. But um, that's just all that they've ever known, was just like barbecue is that great unifier. Not just for my family, but many of, I mean, many of Americans, you know what I mean? Where it's like barbecue is that, that great unifier. Um, and so whenever I think about doing a new concept or whatnot, I try to connect it somehow with, you know, with my upbringing and the foods that I've eaten. And so we try to do the same thing with Cowbird. That's why we're kind of like chicken is soul, chicken is love. And, you know, chicken is chicken. Fried chicken is on a Sunday afternoon, you know, is that's something that, you know, we always enjoyed as well. So why not kind of take my, the same approach that I did with barbecue and do that, you know, with this cool concept but then also create opportunities for, for our staff, but then also the community. Everything we do is centered around the community. We, I was taught that at a young age that, 
you know you don't you don't want to just you want to contribute to to your, to to your city to your community where you are not just be a part of it we have that responsibility i take it serious um the last time that you were here at the common club you commonwealth club you were here with Adrian Miller, yes, the yes, um, yes, author yes. of The Art of Smoke. Uh, yeah. And um, he was mentioning uh, in that interview that um, people had told him that it would be incredibly difficult to find black chefs who were specializing in the art of barbecue. And mm -hmm. he said, with a quick Google search, he found enough to write a book. Right. Um, do you find it odd that um, there's so many people that have maybe not given black chefs who specialize in this culinary cuisine, the highlight, the spotlight that they deserve? Yeah, so earlier on I, I read an article and it was, um, and it talked about uh, the new, the, how black pitmasters are being left out of the new barbecue uh, renaissance that has taken place. And when I think about it, um, you know, I'm like, how is that? How is that possible? You know what I mean, right? Here in America, um, I have a lot of friends that you know that aren't black that are from the South that grew up on barbecue. So it's not to say that hey, you know what, um, barbecue is this black thing. But then you think historically, um, coming out of the South, and then also with with slavery, you had to use these people had to use these poor cuts of meat. And you'd have to cook them over a long period of time, low and slow, to be able to make them tender, to be able to, to make them um, edible, you know, enjoyable, to be able to provide for your family. So when I did read that article, I found that I kind of found that interesting. And um, coming out of my grandmother's backyard, going into the whole farmers market, I was just like, hey, you know what? I want to put out the best product I can. We want to make some money if we can. We did not make any money. <laughs> um, we just want to put out a really great product and feed and touch as many people as possible and show them our love through the art and craft of barbecue. But then after reading that article, it, it made me realize that, hey, you know what? Now I understand the why of what I'm doing versus, you know, the what. I understand why I'm doing barbecue now. And literally, it's just to preserve a, a craft and a food way and to, to be a voice for the voiceless. And there's many men and women that have come before me that's paved the way for me, so I, I pay tribute to that. There's a lot of women now in barbecue all across the South, all across the country that are working fires that's doing it, and it's beautiful, and they inspire me. Because, you know, to work with that fire, it's not easy. You know, it's not easy at all. It's definitely a labor of love. But, you know, there are a lot of people that aren't being recognized for their work. And so what I try to do is, like, I'm grateful that, that people care about what it is that we're doing. You know, I'm very intentional about our brand, our product, and what we're doing. But um, I also, like, bear that responsibility of, like, hey, you know what? What can I do to help and assist in telling these stories, but also shedding a spotlight on people that may not be getting recognition? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think that you mentioned um, to me one of my favorite things that you said in the piece that I ended up producing, the video and the article that I wrote, was that um, horn barbecue is horn barbecue wherever I go in this country. Yeah, yeah, you know, because I'm glad that you said that. Well, because here's the thing. I get messages and DMs all the time where it's like, Hey, I'm from Texas, it better be good. Or, hey, I'm from here, it better be good. And no pressure like, or anything. Yeah, and I'm like, I've been to Texas, and everything I've eaten there has not been good. It's like, <laughs> it, it hasn't, you know what I mean? So it's like, here on the West Coast, I mean, we're used to, you know, Santa Maria-style tri-tip and that sort of thing. So when you do brisket, brisket is a Texas thing, because if you think about Texas, it's an extremely large state with a large abundance of beef. Everything is beef driven in Texas. It's, you know, real big. So it's like the, 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 the brisket, the beef ribs. But if you go down south, they're going to tell you that true barbecue is whole hog barbecue. You know, Alabama, they're cooking, you know, the, the mutton. And if you go down to Memphis and these different regions, there's just, I don't think that California is really, uh, California is a barbecue des. It's becoming a barbecue destination, and we're just trying to play our part in that, right? But when you go to these other places, 
there's barbecue joints on every corner. Um, and so the, the history is a very rich history with there. And the people that come from these different states are just very prideful about their home and their barbecue. So I can understand that. So then when we had our conversation where, you know, anywhere on God's green earth, I fire up a pit, the quality and the love for what we do is still going to be the same. And that's what you can taste. Exactly. I mean, we're using white oak, we're using almond, we mix in cherry, mesquite. We're using these woods here that are available to us here in this region. You go down south, and they're using hickory, and they're using post oak, and, and that's, the, that's the only thing that, um, that really changes it. And then also, you know, the, the palates and the flavors, of, you know, the flavor profile, what you're trying to accomplish with your barbecue. But, you know, I have been inspired by Texas barbecue because the reason why is because I was always looking for a challenge, and that brisket challenged me earlier on. You know, when we were doing farmer's markets, we weren't doing briskets at all. We were just doing pulled pork ribs and chicken, you know. So when I started cooking briskets, I found it difficult earlier on. And I literally, I'm just like, okay, i got to figure this thing out. Or I'm not gonna, I won't go forward until I figure this out. I was just really obsessive about it. And I realized that, you know, love and patience is what makes that barbecue, uh, what separates, separates the barbecue from, you know, other places. But as long as they're loving your heart for what you do, um, you could produce great food. Yeah. You're definitely driving the narrative forward, though, for us here on the West Coast. Thankfully, we have you to lead the charge. But is there something else that you would say defines West Coast barbecue beyond the cuts of meat that you've talked about, using the ingredients um, and the, the wood that's available to you? Anything else as an expert? West Coast Barbecue is? Uh, I, mean, I think with West Coast Barbecue, given that here, on the, here, even here in the Bay Area, we have people from so many different walks of life, so many different cultures. So like with Horn Barbecue, with me being a first generation pit master, um, I don't have to keep myself, I don't have to keep our menu subject to uh, a long line of tradition of just sticking to one particular thing. I can create foods that you know, cook foods that people, um, you know, the traditional barbecue cuts of meat, but then also kind of go out and like do lamb or do like whole smoked duck or that sort of thing. And, you know, have be versatile with our menu offering, which would be familiar for all the variety of people that's here. And I think that with West Coast Barbecue, just using our, our resources and using the, the, the really great rich ingredients that we have here. And how do we make that how do we how do we create something that is approachable for everybody, mm. and that's that's what that's what we focus on. So we're not limited. We're always looking to the same thing. Like when I first started, it's just like how can I be better? How can we be greater? What can we do to take our product to the next level? And that's something that our team is always focusing on. So you've got this amazing product. You have the lines out the door. You've got barbecue that people just absolutely love. Why write a book? A cookbook and share your secrets. Why? Why give that <laughs> all away? <laughs> you know what? Um, so that was always something where I'm like, you know, I never thought, you know, in a million years that I'd want to write a book. But it was just something where I'm like, hey, you know what? I think that based off of everything that's that's happened up to this point, I think it would make sense to pretty much kind of tell the story because a lot of you know people think. There's this whole, like, you know, okay, things happen overnight, and they don't. I mean, this has been, uh, I've been at this for, for a very long, very long time, you know. It's like, the restaurant's been open a year and a half. That's I feel awesome. like I've been doing barbecue for, you know, for 20 years. And the thing about it is, it's like all those all-night cooks um, just sitting by the fire for, for all those years of doing that, um, you know, kind of messed up my sleep for sure, but... I just felt that, hey, you know what, why not pour my heart into the book, do something where people can connect to it, they can, you know, prepare it at home for their families. Um, whether you're in a restaurant, whether you're just in the backyard cooking for family, the recipes are approachable. But then also being extremely transparent with the story and how we got started. and. You know, I mentioned earlier, you know, I did want to quit barbecue, and that's in there. So it's like, you know, you read that in the book that, you know, I did want to quit barbecue, and I explain why. 
And, you know, because there's a lot of people that, you know, hey, I want to get in a barbecue, I want to do that. And I think that barbecue has become uh, trendy, extremely trendy. And um, I just think that, you know, with anyone wanting to get in a barbecue, we shouldn't forget tradition. It's just going back to the whole why of, you know, what I do. I never got into to barbecue to, to make money or anything like that. It was something that took me from a place where I felt like I was in a dark place in my life and there was really nothing to give me purpose and I found that purpose lighting fires and doing something simple that, you know, something that's a part of our American culture, the fabric of this country is barbecue, you know, and it's not just, I get it all the time where they're like, man, it's too expensive and it should be cheap. Barbecue shouldn't be cheap. Barbecue should be one of the most expensive, I mean, it's, it's up there with French cuisine because, you know, when you have people that are sacrificing their sleep to watch a fire maintain temperature, trim meat to spec every single day, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of and work. And it takes a very uh, specific individual to be able to commit itself to the craft of barbecue day in and day out. Yeah. On that note, I think we should throw in one of these questions. Sure. So talking about all of the countless hours and time spent and everything that you do, we have a question here that says, um, Matt, um, when are you going to expand your weekday hours? <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that would be a good one to lead right into. But yeah, I, so I that's a really, whoever asked that question, that's a really great question. Yeah, the, yeah okay, so, <laughs> so right now, so here's the thing. So <laughs> when we started off, I just wanted to do till sell out, right? So we're cooking, we literally fill all the smokers up, we, we prepare to capacity, we cook to capacity, and we wanna make sure that we're able to feed everyone. What's happening now is that we're realizing that we, and we've been talking about this for the past, you know, couple of months or so, we are gonna extend the hours. Woo! So, yeah. <laughs> so, that, so the hours are definitely gonna um, get extended and we wanna be able to offer the product uh, longer than just at sellout or you know at three or four o'clock, so we are we're definitely going to extend it. So we're looking to do that coming into summer. All right, I mean there you go. That answers it. You're making everyone's dreams come true. <laughs> That's what you're doing. Um, okay, we got a couple questions that are somewhat similar. So basically, they're asking, you know, where do you source your your meat from? Um, why is it why is it so great? Wow. So um, we're getting our meats at Creekstone. We're getting, they make some really great um, all natural beef. It's, uh, we're using prime briskets. There's no antibiotics or any, they're not, I mean, this, this is the, some of the best quality uh, beef that you can give because, you know, growing up, a lot of the barbecue I had was really like overcooked, bad quality meat. And that was the thing where people, you know, you just have to cook what you have. And so there was this mindset of trying to find the cheapest meats. You know, because you're trying to make, you know, you're trying to make some money doing it. But um, we have no problem, like, breaking even, like, with our briskets or even losing money because we're not going to sacrifice that quality. I want anyone that comes to Horn Barbecue to be able to, to have good quality barbecue that you could tell, like, hey, you know what? They didn't cut any corners. There was love in this. So we're using, um, yeah, so it's all natural beef. We're using some of the best quality beef we can get. Awesome. Um, let's see here. So we've got another couple questions. I think these two are somewhat similar. So um, it says, after your success with Horn Barbecue and Cowbird, what are your next goals and aspirations? And I think that I know part of that answer is there's another restaurant on the way. Well, the, yeah, well, it's, yeah, you know, and someone asked me, they were like, hey, you know, when do you find time to sleep and why open these restaurants? We want to, like I said, I want to give people that are on our team, like, opportunities to be able to grow and to be able to express themselves creatively. But um, that's, that's the direction that we're going, you know, at Horn Hospitality Group. We're forming, you know, the hospitality group and to be able to create concepts that tell a story of who we are, but then also to be able to pro provide a platform for our team and for other chefs and other aspiring, you know, pit masters that, you know, want to get into it. The purpose of the book was to be able to help with that, but then also like being a resource to, you know, kind of like each one teach one. Mm -hmm. So do you have another spot that's going to be coming out? That you can so do? right now, Cowbird, Cowbird is open now. Um, and we have a spot called Maddie's Old Fashioned, which will be like dry aged burgers. I try to, I try to connect with like 
con you know concepts that are nostalgic that we can all connect to. So we're doing like the dry age burger concept. That's what Maddie's is. And it's named after my son Maddie, <laughs> little Matt Jr. He's a uh, Matt is six right now. He's probably at home trying to play my game, but <laughs> he's just obsessed with the video games. <laughs> little kid. He's a he's a good little boy, but that's his nickname, Maddie. So we're calling it Maddie's Old Fashioned. So we're excited about that, and then um, we're working on some more projects as well. Always hustling. so stuff outside. I mean, you know, uh, the product offering, but you know, I have a line of spices, sauces that are going to be coming out, and then we're uh, working on some larger projects. Yeah, awesome. I will jump in and kind of mention about how important it seems as though family is to you. The the restaurant's going to be named after your son. I'm sorry, I have to give a huge shout out to your wife. Uh, just amazing because she was there with you on day one. Seems as though she supported Dream. And I yeah. have to say that I personally was taken back to my own childhood when I had your recipe for banana pudding. And it was phenomenal. Can you please tell me that recipe? <laughs> and yeah, no, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, that, so that recipe, I mean, we talked about it just kind of like, hey, what are we, we going to do? We're going to do this banana pudding. How are we going to go about it? And she was just like, hey, you know what? I got this. <laughs> and when she said that, I was just like, hey, you know what? I trusted her. And she's executed that banana pudding year after year. I mean, literally to a point where, you know, it's been featured in magazines and recipes and that sort of thing. And you know what? It takes you back to, you know, being over at Grandma's house, the vanilla wafers on top of the refrigerator and mm. that custard and that cream. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like, so yeah. that's what it's about. Yeah. Family is incredibly important to you. And about family that. is. I mean, family is. I mean, it's, 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 it's who we are. I mean, we're all a reflection and an example of the upbringing and the people who loved us and poured into us. So I, I try to honor everybody in my family, but, you know, I wouldn't be the man I am without the women in my life. So family is everything. So shout out to you. Right. I'm telling you, that, that banana pudding. <laughs> All right. So um, here's a fun one. I don't know who did this, but I love it. If you could collaborate with any chef, deceased or alive, who would it be? And... What would you cook? What a great question. Well, let me chef. Hmm. You know what? To the top of my head right now, Chef Francis Malman. Okay. He, um, I mean, he walked away from the whole fine dining. Um, he was a French trained chef, walked away from fine dining, and now lives like in this secluded, uh, he lives out in Patagonia. Walked away from a Michelin star oh, yeah. situation. He did, and literally all he does is just outdoor live fire cooking. And he has this uh, this term called maitranza, which is like the people who are helping the people. He, gra he gathers his friends around. He puts this long table out. He brings out his wines. He has a full fire that's going, and then being able to celebrate each other that way. And I think that's something where that's like actually the direction that we're going as well, doing more events that are centered around live fire cooking and in an environment that's not just a restaurant, but connecting people outdoors. So that's what he does now full time, Chef Francis Malman. I would love to collab with him. Okay, yeah. so the live fire cooking and that. Any any other reason that he would also interest you? Like, as I just like the whole cool kind of, you know, I, see, like with me, I mean, we both look at food and, uh, and connects it with, there's like a romance with the fire and really great food. And so whenever I'm sitting by a fire, anywhere by a fire, I have to have like a nice glass of wine or maybe like a bourbon or a whiskey and then like a cigar. And then I'll have my, my music playing, my Coltrane or or Dizzy Gillespie or whatever. You know, I Amazing. listen to this. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I got this beautiful music. And it's just like, it creates this, uh, this experience. And I try to, you know, I want to share that experience with everybody, as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. That's why when you come to the restaurant, there's, you know, there's beautifully, like, there's soul music that's playing. Yeah. You can smell the smoke. The fires are going. And we try to create this, try to replicate that, that, uh, that environment. You've been very specific with your brand. I love it. It's, it's, it's very much you through and through. I will tell everybody that the um, opening song, and I will never forget this, as you both are opening the doors for the first, the first service at Horn Barbecue, all of a sudden, um, 
at last. Yeah, right. <laughs> Start sweating. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is perfect. <laughs> no, right. No, yeah, that was just like, you know, it started cueing, you know, when you started hearing that at Etta James and you hear those strings. It's something beautiful about those strings, but um, I was, I'm telling you, I was fighting back tears as much as I can when we opened up that door. And when people came in, I was just kind of like, okay, the very first customer, and we're serving them. And I looked up, and this guy, you know, he had, he had his mask on, and he, he was crying. And he was just like, thank you for, for not giving up. And so things like that, I'm just like, you know, it doesn't feel, it doesn't feel, uh, real at all I mean especially given where I where I come from you know what I mean so that's the thing like I said that's why I'm so grateful and people are like why are you so humble you have to be humble in life you have to be grateful I don't look at it work you know because one thing that I do fear is complacency you don't ever want to get comfortable where you are in life I'm grateful I'm humbled and we continue to move forward you know there's more work to do mm. you know it, it's it's interesting because you 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 talk about like the emotion that happened um, that day and you're very like, um, you have this one side that's like very much about family and, and, and respecting, you know, the history and where you've come from. But then there's this other side of you that's incredibly like just driven and um, almost to the point of like, um, you know, obsession, as you mentioned. And I wonder yeah. how much your, um, your military background has played into that. Would you say that that affected you? You know, it, it did. It did. I'm extremely disciplined. Um, there is that. I mean, there is that other side. I mean, I'm um, I'm extremely competitive, and so I'll put out a product and I'll look at it, and I said this before: is like I'm not competing with anybody else. I'm competing with uh, the potential of what I'm capable of, and I, and that's the thing where I'm like, okay, how can I be better, and what am I going to do today to you know, to to burn the boats, to lay the foundation, you know, in the road of where I'm going and what we're building. And like I said, you have to constantly challenge yourself. I think that's where greatness comes from. You know, I've I've never told anybody that, hey, Horn is the best or we make the best food or, or anything like that. It's just I don't cut corners. And so if I put out a product, I'm going to make sure it's the absolute best. And then, you know, it's a challenge where when you're bringing on staff and you're bringing on new people that may not share that same vision, you need to make sure, that one, that they're aligned with the vision and to see that, you know, that they're committed to, to what it is that we're wanting to accomplish. So that's, a, that's another challenge within itself. So I openly, um, you know, I, I openly accept that. Yeah, absolutely. But I am very competitive, <laughs> very competitive. I, I want to be great in everything that I do. And, just like when we were putting out the book, um, you know, when we got the first copy of the book, you know, I went through it and I'm like, I'm like, no, this isn't right. <laughs> I'm like, this isn't right. I mean, we have to, you know, I'm, I, I have to, I don't care how long it takes. I have to go back through this with a fine tooth comb. And, you know, this is what I want to put out. And we went through and we made those changes and we're grateful. We've, it's a beautiful book. And I hope that you all enjoy it if you decide to, you know, if you guys would like to get a copy of the book. <laughs> and uh, They're going to want it. Yeah, right. It's a very beautiful book. You yeah, know. it yeah. is beautiful. No beautiful corners done. Yeah. And I think that that goes along with the branding, right? You've been very specific in how right. the vision of everything looks and making sure that it's all in line. And I think that that's something kind of important about what chefs are doing these days. It's like you have to define exactly how everything is going to be, the branding, and you also have to be on your social media which you are. Well, that was extremely important in the beginning because I'm just like, no one's coming to our tent at the farmer's market. We're, we're losing money every single weekend. I'm trying to convince my wife, like, trust me, it's gonna, we're going to do something great. And she's just kind of like, okay. And she's going out there weekend after weekend. And I'm like, okay, I need to get our guests to, I, I need them to see what, what I'm putting into this Horn Barbecue product. So that transparency earlier on with our guests, but then also using social media to be able to tell the story. So I've been very adamant about using social media to be able to connect with different people. And then we've had guests that have come to the pop-ups like, hey, we don't have social media. Uh, if I didn't see it in the newspaper, I didn't hear about it sort of thing. And I'm just like, okay, how do you be able to connect with that generation as well? Yeah. You know, so those are things that, you know, we've had to, you know, deal with and face. And, 
it's, it's definitely worked out because we're very, very strategic about the brand. You are, you are. And I, I think it's a great time to kind of segue into the future of hospitality. Um, I think I've shared this with you, but I also, in addition to the things that I've done, I actually worked in restaurants for 15 years myself. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> hospitality's changing. It's different than it was, and the pandemic completely shifted it. Um, can we talk about that? I mean, the day that you opened, the pandemic regulations had just changed. So right before uh, you were about to have the green light to open your restaurant, people yep. were gonna be able to sit inside and enjoy right. the full experience. Right. But the, the day that you opened, uh, right before the mandates had changed, and so people couldn't even enjoy the space that you had built. Where do you think the future of hospitality is going now? I think, yeah, you're, you're definitely right. The, the whole pandemic exposed a lot, of, uh, a lot of different things within the restaurant and you know, within hospitality as a whole. But I think hospitality is going in a direction that's going to be a little bit more innovative, more focused on social media, um, creating different ways to be able to offer your product. Um, I think there's a lot of chefs that are going away from the whole brick and mortar, um, that whole process of trying to open a restaurant and serve your food that way. They've been more creative with other other ways of doing it. You know, there's... Um, there's this really cool guy named Sean with Cali, his is like Cali Barbecue, and we had a really great conversation, and he's doing a lot of great things where he's creating more like commissary kitchens and and that sort of thing, and making our, because before it was just like, okay, hey, look, we're not gonna deliver our food. We're not gonna deliver food. We're not gonna use these third-party apps and that sort of thing. But what he, what, what's happening now is that people are trying to find ways to make it more, um, convenient for guests to be able to get your product mm -hmm. and then you know marketing it through the social media platform so i think that the pandemic is you know we'll come out stronger on the other side which we are i mean we decided literally i mean unfortunately there was restaurants that, that had to shut down and that was sad to see and, and it was very unfortunate and you know and these are the conversations that we had you know how do we, how do we continue to go forward and i'm just one of those kind of guys where i'm like you know what, we have to push through it, we gotta fight through it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and we did, and we kept our door, we never shut down our doors. Our dining room definitely was closed, but we were blessed to be able to have an outdoor area that, you know, you sit a hundred guests out there. So um, so guests were able to come to Horn Barbecue and enjoy it comfortably. Um, but, you know, we, we had to just keep pushing forward. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And you had to keep defining what you wanted for yourself, right? I think you mentioned the third-party apps, right? So lots of restaurants had to pivot. They had to figure out ways to get the product to the people in order to continue to make money. I mean, one of the things that you pride yourself on, I believe, is that your meats are cut to order. Correct. There's no getting anything that's been sitting. It's like even if people are picking up from you to go, it's not cut until they've arrived, right? Exactly. So that was another thing where it was like, okay, you know, we need to be innovative with our approach and, and how do we move forward? So given that, you know, with smoked meats, if you know, when you start slicing that meat up and then you package it up, it begins to oxidize and all kinds of other things happen with it. So um, we've been thinking of ways where it was just kind of like, hey, you know, how do we get our product to every door in the Bay Area? but then be able to serve it fresh, you know? And as things have changed, our guests are still coming to the restaurant. We're grateful for that. But that's something that even still now that we're, we're looking like, okay, how can we be more innovative with that? Just like the gentleman in the back, like when are you gonna extend your hours? It's like, I was really stuck on like, just like, hey, you know what? Um, when we sell out, we sell out. And that was a way of us communicating to our guests that what we've prepared for today is done. So what we're going to do is we're going to start preparing for tomorrow to make sure that you're getting the freshest product as possible. But then there's ways to do that where, okay, we need to figure out a system of like, okay, let's continue to extend our hours so that we could be able to, you know, feed more people. And that's, that's what we're going to do. And summer, I mean, you know, spring and summer is coming around and Ugh. Yeah. Get in there early, everybody. Yeah. The lines, <laughs> they're going to be all the way down the block. But we got pre-ordering, too. Pre-ordering, yeah. So definitely. there's a line. There's, there will be a line, but also you can pre-order. And, you know, you don't have to wait in a long line. You can come pick up your, and you want to 
dine in and eat it there, you could do it. And still get some of the same amazing product. Absolutely, absolutely. Right. Couple more questions. Um, let's see here. So speaking of the brand, um, someone has asked, do you see your brand um, branching out and going into a cooking show, potentially Food Network? Hmm. Question mark? You know what? Yes. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> we do. I mean, like, I, w I would love to, to do something like that. I think that that would be really cool. I feel like if, 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 it's, if it's done correctly and, you know, we're able to, to do it in a way that's genuine and sincere, you know what I mean? I don't want to, we don't want to run through, like, a, a grocery store trying to grab things with a timer. And that's, like, <laughs> that's not, you know, because our thing takes time and patience. So I think that... If we were to create something like that, it would be something that would be, you know, really connect with the with the viewer. But we that is definitely something that we're gonna do. Okay, so let's see here. A um, couple of the last questions: How do you view the Bay Area food scene, especially Oakland, the Bay Area and Oakland food scene? Um, where do you see it going, and and what do you think about it in general? To be honest, I mean, a lot of people say that Oakland is one of the greatest dining destinations and it, and it wasn't always that way what are your thoughts I you know to be completely honest with you maybe um, I think this was maybe maybe back in 2016 2017 I read an article where it was like Oakland is the next big uh, foodie city and the thing with Oakland is like there's so many different talented chefs and there's so much different food offering I, I believe that it is a, a great food destination in this country Oakland for sure is and I think that was one of the things where it's like we're grateful to be there, but we're contributing to that. But then there's other chefs that are pouring into their cultures and, and, and being able to deliver product that's, that's phenomenal. So, yeah, Oakland for sure is like definitely a food destination. Do you have any spots that you especially like to frequent? I think I saw a video of you going around <laughs> uh, the Bay Area, seeing some of your your favorite places. Anybody else that that inspires you, who's also doing things in Oakland? Yeah, so like Chef Chef Rain for sure, Chef Knight, uh, my buddy Chef Nelson. We always go over to uh, we always order from Alamar, and we go eat there. Um, and his new spot. Yeah, Sober Mesa. So we go over there and get cocktails and whatnot. Um, Chef James over at Comey, like, is doing some really great stuff, and there's a really cool, uh, it used to be a pop-up, now they have a brick and mortar called Hi Felicia. Yes. And this, th that chef is talented, so, I don't want to say any more of my favorites, I don't want to leave anybody out. Yeah, okay. It's very diplomatic of you. <laughs> um, all right, one of the last couple questions here. Uh, do you think there will ever be a second horn barbecue location? Um, you know, well, the, so so we do. So we we definitely want to, you know, open another location. But I think that uh, one of the challenges that we've that we face is just uh, is staffing, and everybody everybody is is dealing with that. But that's that's definitely one of the challenges because you know we're not. We don't have a rotating menu, and we're not using tweezers and that sort of thing. It's literally just like shovels and fire. <laughs> and, uh, the exact opposite. Right. So it's like if you enjoy playing with fire, you know, come and cook barbecue. <laughs> come cook barbecue with us. But it's just literally just finding people that are committed to who we are and what we're what we're wanting to do. But I feel like that love should be uh, shared with uh, different locations and that sort of thing. So I hope so. We hope to open a second location for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think along those lines too, as we were talking about hospitality, the change in the future of that and um, what the pandemic has done, it continues to allow you to do exactly what you want to do. I think that restaurants mm -hmm. now more than ever, they're not saying, oh, the customer's always right. You know, we've, we've got to make sure that we're doing this. I think that people are becoming more and more true to their visions and what they, they like. And just like you said, um, folks are still coming to see you. They've, they've yeah. bought into what you've created. And so earlier on, I would just always just get, you know, you, you hear a good review, you hear a bad review. And then it's just like, okay, when a customer communicates a negative review, right? And they're like, okay, one star, two stars, or three, whatever. You know, I look at that like, okay, is there something within this that we could change? Mm -hmm. So that, I look at that, is there something that we could change? And there's a lot of times where, you know, people may be going through things in life and then they come in 
And because we are in the service industry, they use these platforms as a way to, to vent frustration. And um, I don't think that that's fair, but you know, as restaurants, we do need to look at, okay, is there any validity in what this guest is saying? Is this something that we can change? And if it is something that we could change, we could change it. But then, you know, I've realized that, you know what, you can't please everyone. We try to do the best we can. And then, you know, you're dealing with extremely high turnover rate. Not just, yeah, we don't understand that in the restaurant industry, the turnover rate is extremely high. Coming out of the pandemic, it's even worse. So you may, you know, you're teaching, like these are the philosophies of foreign barbecue. This is who we are. Here's the recipe book. This is how you prepare this. And then you may have somebody there today and then somebody gone tomorrow. And then you're hiring and then you're bringing in someone new and then you have to retrain all over again. This is something that happens regularly within restaurants. And, you know, some people may take that and understand it. Some people, they don't, you know. And we, I deal with, you know, people waiting in line and we try to make that experience as comfortable and as pleasant as possible. We don't want people waiting all day in line. I want people to be able to come in, get our product, come in and out, you know. So it's like we're finding different ways, even with how we're running our service, to be able to make that experience more pleasurable. Absolutely. All right. I think I have uh, time for one more question. So we saw a couple of hands in the audience uh, of folks who'd actually been. Yeah, like two uh, hands. <laughs> two hands. <laughs> I'm just, They're in the city. Yeah, so I'm it's chuckling. It's hard I'm to get chuckling. over the bridge. Yeah. But hopefully. We gotta, yeah, right, right. They're yeah. going to head out there. They're going to head gotta out bring there. It to, they'll bring it over the bridge. There right. you go. Yeah, right. Um, so for the rest of everyone who's going to be going to Horn Barbecue soon, right? What's the one thing that you hope all of these folks feel when they're in a Horn Barbecue restaurant? When you come to Horn Barbecue, I want, one, I want you to feel like you're at home and not just like, I just got off of work, I'm tired, I don't want to be here, I got to go. What I'm saying is, is like the essence of what family and what love is. So when you're gathering with your loved ones, I want you to feel that whenever you come and have a bite of Horn Barbecue. But then also look and taste the barbecue and know that there was no corners that was cut. There's nothing that we're, we're trying to hide. We're extremely transparent with our brand, but then also our product. And just the taste of love and everything that we do. And then we want you guys to come back. And continue to come back and come hang out with us. And we don't want you to leave. Uh, you definitely will leave full. We don't want you to leave on an empty stomach. And it's just kind of like being back at home, you know what I mean? And I grew up in a, I grew up in a, a household where, you know, everybody had all these Southern traditions and stuff like that. And we, I mean, we would eat and... Come to Horn Barbecue and say you guys can just come eat, all right? Just come eat. <laughs> I think that sums just it up perfectly. Right. Um, so um, that's pretty much all the time that we have for this evening's program. But I wanted to thank all of you for joining you. us in person. And also all of you um, virtually, thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, yeah. We are going to actually have some books that um, you'll be able to sign for folks who want to take home some of your... Cool your horn secrets yeah, and right. um, make some of the food at home. And um, after that, you all are welcome to have some delicious barbecue um, yeah. from, from your recipes yeah. that you have. Yep. Um, so please join me in thanking Matt. And also, you're going to have me on your Food Network show when you get it, right? Absolutely. All right, perfect. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, yeah. Thank you all so much. <laughs>